What exactly makes someone a founding father of the United States? There's no single agreed upon criteria, but most historians agree that it has to be someone who was central to the foundation of the United States, either in the revolution or through the creation and signing of certain foundational documents, the Continental Association, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the United States Constitution. And if you look at all the names on all of those documents, it could be a very broad list or it could be contracted down to only a few who played a significant difference. But of all the people who signed all those documents, there was only one who signed all four. And you probably don't even know his name. Roger Sherman played a vital role in the foundation of the United States that still affects us today. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Roger Sherman was born to a family of farmers in the colony of Massachusetts in 1721. They were not a family of special means, and William supplemented his farming income by working as a shoemaker. Roger's education relied only on his father's library and grammar school. He first learned the trade of shoemaking, probably from his father. Roger did benefit from the tutelage of a Harvard-educated minister of the town, Samuel Dunbar, who helped him learn science and mathematics. After his father's death in 1741, he moved with his mother and siblings to New Milford, Connecticut, where he and his older brother opened a store. He was naturally bright. In the 1740s, he brought some notes to a lawyer regarding a petition he hoped to put before the court, and the lawyer was so impressed that he suggested Sherman pursue the law himself. These notes are as good as any petition I could have prepared myself. It would be a few years later before Sherman took him up on that advice. He quickly found a place in public life. By 1742, he was town clerk, and his skill with math helped him become a surveyor of lands for the county of New Haven. By 1745, at just the age of 24, he served in many town offices as a grand juryman, list taker, leather sealer, and fence viewer in charge of making sure fences were up to statute. He released a yearly almanac from 1750 to 1761. Almanacs were a big deal in the mid-1700s. Except for the Bible, probably no book was held in greater esteem or was more widely read in the colonies in the late 18th century than the Almanac. In 1754, he was admitted to the bar of Litchfield, Connecticut, despite having no formal legal training, and became successful, appearing in 17 cases in December of 1754. He served in the Connecticut House of Representatives from 1755 to 1758, and again from 1760 to 1761. His rise as a public official continued. In 1762, he was appointed a Justice of the Peace and a judge of the Court of Common Pleas in 1765. He was elected to the Governor's Council of the Connecticut General Assembly from 1766 to 1785 and was a Justice of the Superior Court of Connecticut from 1766 to 1789. He vocally opposed the Stamp Act, leading a meeting in New Haven to instruct the city's delegates, which included himself, to oppose the act. In 1768, he wrote that no colonial assembly on this continent will ever concede that the Parliament has authority to tax the colonies. He was also a supporter of Yale College in New Haven, serving as the college treasurer and teaching religion classes. He was awarded an honorary Master of Arts from the college in 1768. By 1774, his bona fides as a Connecticut leader made him an obvious choice for the First Continental Congress. Sherman stood on the most radical side of the argument at this Congress and thought that the resolutions made did not go far enough. Most colonial politicians felt that Parliament could regulate external colonial affairs, but Sherman denied even that, a position that would soon be popularized by James Wilson, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams. According to Adams, Sherman believed that the Parliament of Great Britain had authority to make laws for America in no case whatever. He was a signer of the Articles of Association, in which the 12 colonies represented, all except Georgia, agreed not to import goods from Great Britain or Ireland. He was appointed to the Second Continental Congress as well, and voted for and signed the Declaration and Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms, approved by Congress on July 6, 1775, several months after fighting broke out at Lexington and Concord. In June of 1776, he was appointed to the Committee of Five, along with Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Robert Livingston, who would draft the Declaration of Independence. The committee left no minutes, and besides contradictory later accounts from Adams and Jefferson, it's unknown precisely what part Sherman played in the drafting. Adams says the committee had several meetings in which were proposed the articles of which the declaration was to consist, and that Jefferson then wrote the draft, and that Sherman and Franklin offered no criticism on it. But it is impossible to know if or what Sherman's comments may have been. We do know that he was held in high esteem by his contemporaries, including Jefferson, who once pointed at Sherman and said, There goes a man who never said a foolish thing in his life. 
Sherman was also appointed to two other committees at the time. First was the Committee of Thirteen, with a representative from each colony, which would draft the Articles of Confederation. And second was the Board of War and Ordnance, with four others, including John Adams, Benjamin Harrison, James Wilson, and Edward Rutledge, meant to oversee the Continental Army. Roger Sherman was the only delegate to serve on all three. He would also serve on many other committees. On July 12, 1776, Sherman's committee presented the first draft of the Articles of Confederation, which saw significant debate in Congress before being finalized in November 1777. Sherman signed it as a Connecticut representative on July 9, 1778. The years between the Declaration and the Constitutional Convention were busy ones, even under the ineffective Confederation government. Sherman served the country throughout most of those years, serving in the Continental Congress until 1784. He was a supporter of hard money and generally against the rapidly depreciating paper Continentals Congress printed. He was a dominant figure at a 1777 convention that recommended that the states draw in and sink bills of credit issued by several states. Sherman and four others also presented a report that recommended admitting the then independent country of Vermont into the Union in 1781, but thanks to other opposition, Vermont would remain independent until 1790. Simultaneously, Sherman was active at home in Connecticut. Connecticut was especially active in providing troops for the war effort, and George Washington himself singled out Connecticut for its work fulfilling troop quotas. Sherman served on the Connecticut Council of Safety in 1777 to 1779 and in 1782. The Council of Safety had the full power and authority to order and direct the militia and navy of this state when the assembly wasn't in session. Despite a rough winter, he and the Connecticut delegates were able to reach Congress in time to vote to ratify the Treaty of Paris that ended the Revolutionary War. Afterwards, he was elected mayor of New Haven, and in 1783 he worked with another man to revise the entirety of Connecticut law and make such alterations, additions, exclusions, and amendments as they shall judge proper. By far, however, Sherman's greatest contributions to the nation republic came from the Constitutional Convention. The convention, referred to as Federal Convention or Philadelphia Convention, had been endorsed by the Confederation Congress only to alter the Articles of Confederation, but from the beginning delegates, especially Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, helped to create an entirely new constitution, which led to the introduction of the Virginia Plan, which outlined a much stronger national government. Sherman was chosen as a delegate from Connecticut. He was the second oldest delegate at age 66, behind Benjamin Franklin at age 81. Sherman was apparently always a man of relatively few words. As a judge, he was known for his brevity, clearness, and soundness, and said to be a terse, ineloquent speaker. His contributions and actions at the convention have also generally been relegated to the background because he never kept a personal record of his time there. However, Sherman was one of the most active speakers at the convention, spoke more often than all but three others, and this despite having taken a week of the convention in Connecticut. He made 160 motions or seconds in regard to the Virginia plan. James Madison made 177. He emerged as one of Madison's primary opponents and skillfully used rhetoric, timing, and compromise to manipulate the design agenda and alternatives. He staked out positions diametrically opposed to Madison and then expressed a readiness to compromise on a middle ground. His work there was vital, with one historian arguing that the Sherman-Madison dynamic permitted the convention's achievement. Sherman was not even supposed to go to the convention. Erastus Wolcott, one of the three delegates, refused to attend because he feared being exposed to the smallpox, and Sherman was chosen to replace him. The Virginia Plan was introduced to the convention on May 29, 1787, two days after a quorum reached Philadelphia. Sherman arrived on the 30th. Delegates already knew that Sherman was likely to oppose the plan, with one man writing that Sherman was disposed to patch up the old scheme and that he was not easily managed. If he suspects you are trying to take him in, you may as well catch an eel by the tail. Especially troubling to Sherman was the introduction of a bicameral legislature. He opposed the popular election of the lower house, fearing that the mass of people lacked sufficient wisdom to govern themselves and that state legislatures should appoint the representatives. The primary issues to Sherman were that it had been unable to enforce its decrees, not that it had acted foolishly or threatened anyone's liberties. But his position was clearly in the minority. On the day he arrived, the convention agreed that a national government ought to be established, consisting of a supreme legislative, executive, and judiciary, already a large step from Sherman's vision of a national government under the reins of state legislatures. Debate on May 31st proved that the convention largely supported direct popular elections, but Sherman was vocal and helped push the convention to decide that state legislatures should choose senators. Among the most hotly debated topics at the convention was the composition and power of the legislative branch. On June 11th, Sherman proposed that the lower house proportion should be chosen by the respective numbers of free inhabitants, and that in the second branch or senate, each state should have one vote and no more. 
His motion was defeated then, but the issue soon catalyzed further. The New Jersey Plan, which echoed many of Sherman's positions, made it clear that a small states were not willing to give up power that they had held under the Articles. Sherman reiterated his proposal on June 20th, and it continued to be debated throughout the month. A committee, dubbed the Grand Committee, was formed of one representative from each state to devise and report some compromise. Sherman became the Connecticut representative when the first choice was unable to serve. The committee returned with a proposal that in the first branch, each state shall be allowed one member for every 40,000 inhabitants, while in the Senate, each state would have an equal vote. During arguments of the proposal, Sherman predicted that there was no probability that the number of future states would exceed that of existing states, a prediction which proved very wrong, but that new states should be treated the same as existing ones, because we are providing for our posterity, for our children and our grandchildren, who will be as likely to be citizens of new western states as of the old states. Sherman was adamant that the state vote should be equal, not so much for the security of the small states as for the state governments, which could not be preserved unless they were represented. On July 16th, the convention agreed with the proposal, with the change that the Senate representatives could vote independently and not in a block like in the Confederation Congress. Sherman defended the Constitution in several essays, remained active as a member of Congress, arguing against some parts of the Bill of Rights. Sherman thought that separation of powers was an error in politics. Connecticut didn't have a separation of powers. He generally believed that a Bill of Rights was unnecessary. In fact, at the convention, he argued as much, because the state Bill of Rights were still in force. But public perception and political opposition, of course, proved the demand for the Bill of Rights. The importance of that compromise, which has been called the Connecticut Compromise, the Great Compromise, or simply the Sherman Compromise, cannot be overstated. Prior to that compromise, the delegations from the small states were threatening to abandon the convention. Rhode Island had decided not to send delegates at all. It is not at all hyperbole to say that that compromise was a linchpin that allowed us to create the new Constitution. It wasn't the only compromise that was made at the Constitutional Convention, but it is, of course, fundamental to the character of American government today. Roger Sherman remained mayor of New Haven for the rest of his life. He only left his position as a judge when he became first a member of the House of Representatives and then a United States Senator. He died in his sleep in July of 1793 at the age of 72, probably of typhus. But his contributions to the character of the American system of government continued on into the present day. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.